I'm going to uh, ask you to take your seats, please, if you're all not already seated. <clears throat> please take your seats. <clears throat> I want to welcome you to the uh, 25th Annual CSWA Luncheon, honoring social workers and community advocates in social welfare in California. And while I talk, please feel free to go ahead and eat. It will not bother me at all. It will not bother anyone else at all. We're going to try very uh, diligently today to stay right on target. Everyone is uh, on a very uh, restricted schedule today, I know, and uh, therefore I'm going to make a few announcements to introduce our program today, and then you'll have some 20 minutes or so to eat without me talking, and we will actually start the program today at 1225. So uh, please feel free to uh, begin eating. In the meantime, let me begin with a, a, a brief overview of the California Social Welfare Archives, who we are, what we do. Uh, the CSWA was established in 1979 for the specific purpose of collecting and preserving materials and information of historical significance in the evolution of social welfare in the state of California so that it would be available for future generations, including students, teachers, researchers, historians, and those interested in this topic. Now, more than 30 years later, the CSWA is a nonprofit organization operating under the auspices of the School of Social Work and affiliated with the special collections of the university libraries. As it evolved over the years, in addition to collecting materials, the CSWA began capturing oral histories of significant contributors to social welfare in California. And in 1987, with the inauguration of the George Nickel Award, the CSWA began to publicly acknowledge and recognize the individuals making significant contributions to social welfare. Consistent with this function in 2002, the fledgling California Hall of Distinction found a home in the CSWA and today inducts social workers from across the state into the hall uh, on an annual basis. In 2010, in recognition of one of our founding members, Francis Lomas Feldman, we added to uh, our recognition roster the Francis Feldman Excellence in Education Award. So, uh, there's much more I could say, but what I would uh, strongly urge you to do is take a look at our web page. The web address is on the back of your program, and uh, check out and become familiar with the items that we have in our holdings. As we celebrate the 25th Donors Luncheon today, uh, we pay tribute to that tradition of recognizing social workers and community activists who have made significant contributions to social welfare. And for that occasion, uh, I want to thank all of you for sharing in this event with us today, and in particular, I want to recognize a few people who are here today. To begin with, if I could ask those members of the board of the California Social Welfare Archives who are present to stand and be recognized, and there are so many of you, I'm not going to name all of you since your names are in the program, but if you would stand, please. A very hard-working board. Dorothy Fleischer, the chair of our program committee and her committee members and special guests, M Marilyn Flynn, dean of the USC School of Social Work and an ex-officio member of the California Social Welfare Archives, Joshua Holo, dean of the Hebrew Union College, Jim Kelly, who is um, president of Menlo College and the President of the National Association of Social Workers, uh, Paul Maiden, who is the Vice Dean of Academic Affairs at the USC School of Social Work, Donna Munker, who has flown in from New York to be one of our presenters today, and uh, I think a lifelong member of the California Social Welfare Archives because I think many of the early activities may have taken place in your home. Is that true, Donna? So a, a very strongly committed supporter. Thank you, Donna. Jennifer Watt, the Assistant Director of the NASW Foundation, is joining us from Washington uh, in recognition of the uh, contributions of SUPEC to the field of social work. 
Arita Kral, former director of the LA County Department of Mental Health and a former director of the San Diego Department of Mental Health is also one of our special guests today. Uh, Dick Thor, who is a president emerita of the uh, California Social Welfare Archives is also with us today. Past honorees and recipients of the George Nickel Award include uh, and are present today uh, Ellen Sachs, uh, Ann Thor, David Caroda, Barbara Kaplan, Monica White, and Ralph Furtick. Thank you all for coming back to help us uh, initiate a new generation, a new group of uh, honorees. Please enjoy your lunch, conversation with friends and acquaintances, and I will be back in about 20 minutes. Thank you. Dean of the School of Social Work at USC, who will introduce our speaker of the day and uh, present our very first George Nickel Award. Well, welcome. I'm really glad to be here with you today um, at the uh, CSWA annual luncheon, which has uh, developed over the years into uh, a wonderful event. Um, CSWA really has a special role in our school and for our profession as a whole. Um, it has two main functions which are unique in combination. First, uh, the purpose is to honor pioneers and exceptional leaders in the field of social work and social welfare. And for that purpose, we've created a hall of distinction. Many of you have come to that event uh, when we present these awards. And second, the archive supports scholarly work and tries to preserve the history, the social welfare history of California by capturing and archiving relevant materials and oral history interviews. There, to my knowledge, there are actually only two social welfare archives, formal social welfare archives in the United States. One is at the University of Minnesota and the other is here. So together, the Hall of Distinction and the archives really represent unique research tools for schools and universities throughout the state. On days such as this, CSWA gives us an opportunity to come together and to be inspired and to recognize extraordinary work that's been done to advance the education of practice and social welfare. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce a leader in the Los Angeles community who is dedicated to social justice and civic engagement. Dr. Hersher serves not only as executive director of the Skirball Cultural Center, which he founded, but also as a professor of American Jewish history at our neighboring institution of higher education Hebrew Union College, and he is an ordained rabbi. His family immigrated from Germany as Jewish refugees in the 1930s to what was then British Palestine. He was born in Tel Aviv and grew up under the tense period that saw the end of the mandate and the beginning of the idealism that fueled the state of Israel. Coming to the United States in the 1950s, his family settled in San Jose, California, where they were welcomed and where they thrived. He earned his bachelor's degree in history and sociology, which I, for which I've already commended him because I did the same thing. Um, but he got his from UC Berkeley, I did not. 
Um, and he then subsequently received his doctorate in American Jewish history from Hebrew, Hebrew Union College in 1973. In the early 1970s, he was National Dean of Admissions of Hebrew Union College, and then in 1975, he was appointed Executive Vice President and Dean of Faculty for the Four Campus College. He held that position until 1995. Believe me, that's a long time to be a dean. As uh, founding president and CEO of the Skirball Cultural Center, Dr. Hersher began work on the conceptual blueprint for Skirball in the early 1980s. His goal was to establish a Jewish institution in the American context that would be inspired by the parallels between Jewish va values and American democratic principles. Since then, he has led the way in establishing the Skirball as a preeminent community gathering place that features world-class programming and provides the opportunity for people to make meaningful connections across generations, communities, histories, ideas, and forms of creative expression. The School of Social Work is truly honored also to have uh, a part of our program offered at the Skirball where all of our students have been offered their education in such exceptional surroundings. Dr. Hersher is the author of several books on Jewish immigration to the United States and the sociology of American Jewish life. His articles and reviews have appeared in more than 30 academic journals. He holds honorary degrees from the University of Southern California and American Jewish University. And he recently completed his five-year term as a commissioner on the Los Angeles City Ethics Commission. Uh, at this time, I'd like to read a message from uh, President of uh, USC, CL Max Nikias. President Nikias has written, We are now privileged to have the opportunity to recognize Dr. Hersher for his devotion to building a better society through educational and cultural programs committed to raising awareness about ethnic and cultural diversity and promoting tolerance and community. Dr. Uh, Hersher has been an invaluable advisor to three different USC presidents. He was instrumental in forging the strong academic relationship between Hebrew Union College and USC, a partnership that is unique, truly it's unique in higher education. At a personal level, the president writes, I have benefited immensely from his wisdom and his friendship. The entire Trojan family joins with our School of Social Work in honoring Dr. Hersher today for his impact on our community and our world. At this point, I'm honored to present the 2011 George D. Nickel Award for Outstanding Contributions to Social Welfare to Dr. Yuri Hersher. Dr. Hersher. Thank you very much. And I thank all of you here who are preservers of memory. Nothing more important to me and to the world in order to get any perspective on welfare is to know that which came before us. And that's what you do. You archive memory and you hope, we all hope, that that memory will apply uh, with a perspective, with a perspective to the welfare of California and beyond. Um, uh, there are too many people who feel that life actually began with their birth. Uh, boy, are we in trouble, aren't we? 
uh, we really, we're, we are in trouble. If you feel that life began with your birth, uh, there will be no social welfare. There won't be. Um, I'd like to, um, again, it's very important to me to thank all the members of the staff and your board for making this happen. You know, these are efforts that we often shun aside, but to set the tables, to bring out the food, to break the bread, that just does not appear from the earth. Although we bless the bread and we thank God for bringing bread from the earth, the truth is none of us have ever gotten up in the morning and found a loaf of, be of bread in the garden. Okay, so, so somehow it took a huge amount of human labor to set the seed and it, maybe it's the baker who's the last to, 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 to make the bread deliver to our table. And, and so bread is not just bread. It's, it's a huge labor of nourishing. It's the sun, it's the rain, it's a commitment. And when we're asleep, the bakeries are baking this bread. So I appreciate everything that's on our table and I appreciate the people who sit around the table. And it's very nice of you to consider me for this honor. Uh, as, as those who asked me, specifically Dorothy Fleischer, uh, I've only allowed myself to uh, be honored once before. And the deal is always, I am not worthy of honor. Um, the people who are worthy of honor are the people who shaped my life, not I. Uh, and so what I'm going to do for, and, and I really do keep to the time, they gave me five hours and I told them 20 minutes, <laughs> 20 minutes will suffice. And, uh, uh, and, and, and then maybe five to 10 minutes of a, of a Q and A. Uh, so I'm going to share with you welfare through my lenses. Um, I'd like to begin, and then I'll go back, I'd like to begin with the age of 18. I am graduating from high school. Uh, my father a cabinet maker, my mother a laundress. Um, and uh, the gift given to me at the age of 18 after the graduation from Lincoln High School, at the Rose Garden, was my father with tears uh, giving me a, a uh, about 20 to 30 letters uh, with a rubber band around them. And he said, this is your legacy. They were letters written in Yiddish, Eastern European uh, Jewish lingo primarily. Um, and he said, and what I've done, Uri, I have, or son, whatever he called me, uh, I've translated them from Yiddish to German, and now it's your turn to translate them from German to English. And that's what I did. And I did it with a lot of tears. It was a view of social welfare. I'll mention two letters, one from my paternal grandmother, one from my maternal grandmother. My maternal grandmother, uh, when she does receive a visa to go to um, Mandate Palestine, writes my father and says, you know, I've just taken in a child born out of wedlock, and I will not leave without the child. They both meet their demise in Auschwitz. Welfare, had she thought of herself alone, she would have left the child, but there was no such thing. Same train, the letters are there, and this child, Maxie, and my mother uh, are on their way to the death camp. You cannot put that letter away. That letter becomes part of who you are and it says, you come from a stock where a grandmother would not neglect 
a child she took in, and she will not go to what would have been her life and freedom without the child. Definition of hunger comes from another letter, namely my paternal grandmother, who exchanges letters with my father, and, and when my father said, uh, Dear mother, are you hungry? She's still in Cologne, and she's uh, on her way to Antwerpen, from there to Auschwitz. Um, and you know what she writes? Dear son, I'm not hungry, but let me tell you the day that I would feel that I'm hungry. And that's the day when somebody comes to my door and asks for food and I don't have enough to share. Welfare? Amazing. Two letters. Now let's go back. Um, two letters at 18, which I want to assure you are anchors to the Skirball Cultural Center today. And they give me enormous strength. And if you ever come to my office, you will see the letters. And I face them every single day. And if there's a nasty caller, I just look at the letter. I said, you know what? This conversation has come to an end and I hang up. It's as simple as that. When you have this sort of anchor and that sort of an example, you ain't going to feel sorry for yourself and your feelings are not quickly to get hurt. They're not going to get hurt. Um, going back, I was raised in Israel uh, mandate Palestine by two uncles, uh, both who had created the kibbutz system, another welfare system. And um, I am proud to say to you that even when the CIA came to see me before, um, before I entered the, uh, uh, the armed forces I never went, but, but uh, I, I went through all the, the CIA came to see me just to show you how great they were already in 1960. They said, Uri Hersher, are you a communist? And I said, I don't know. Um, I'm a student at Berkeley and I, maybe that's enough. Um, and they said, look, um, do you have uncles who live in Kibbutz Kfar Masaryk and Kibbutz Beit Zera? I said, yeah, they're the greatest. So how influenced were you by them? And I said, totally. Totally. And they said, but you know they were communists. I said, they were the best. Absolutely the best. They had an ideology. You're thinking of political communism, and they only knew economic communism. Big difference. And what I grew up on, under their wings. And basically, as children on a kibbutz, um, we all clothed ourselves the same way. At the end of the day, you'd bring in your dirty clothes. The next, you'd, you'd, you'd get new clothes and you would eat communally just the way we are, and you would have conversations. And what were the conversations about? How to make the world better. How to make the world better. So you, 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 you put in your time working. Incidentally, if you're an, an engineer, you also wash dishes uh, because an ism, an ism is a doctrine. And, 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 and if you're a true believer to it, uh, and I love to sit next to people who are true believer, the believers in welfare. Whoa! What better company can you have? You can't have any better company. They all want civility. They're all dreaming of utopias that at the end don't work out. But, but it, it ain't boring. 
It's just not boring. And my uncles weren't boring, and they would not get into me. They would just say, you know, Uri, this is what you must do, and this is what you must do all the way. And if I disagreed with them, the answer is you cannot disagree with us. Okay. Um, I miss them. I miss my grandparents. I miss my uncles very much because I knew they had a purpose and they had a goal. And without purpose and without goal, for me, life is meaningless. Just meaningless. Let me tell you, so that's how I grew up. And that's how I arrived with the best transition America could have offered me. San Jose, California, agrarian city, the fruit capital of the world. That's when I arrived to San Jose. There were no distinctions among track homes. You could drive around San Jose and you could not find a mansion. So you had a real middle class. You didn't have the poor, you didn't have the rich. The house cost $9,350. Within five years of immigration, my parents owned a house. Try that today, five years after immigration. So my feeling about the United States and its potential was based on that particular uh, experience. Try being the only Jewish kid in a high school. Try being a, the only Jewish kid in a high school where 60% um, came from Central and Latin America. Try teachers, try teachers who try to get rid of my accent and, and, and they, they would do it after school and they would basically say Okay, Uri, here are the problems with vowels in the Hebrew language. And you're never going to lose your accent if you don't follow me in the following kind of poem he created. Because remember, it was a cannery city. So he said, okay, Uri, repeat after me. A canner, exceedingly canny, one morning said to his granny, a canner can can anything he can, but a canner cannot can a can, can he? <laughs> now, I bring this to laughter, but I must tell you what it did for me. In my view of the goodness of people and trying to let an immigrant know that you've come to a country where you do have a chance. And when I naturalized, the, a judge called me and says, come on, I want to talk to you for a minute. Do you want to change your name? And I said, to what? <laughs> he said, well, your middle name is David. Your first name is Uri, but everyone will call you Yuri. And Yuri is close to urine. And the nicest person in the world to, 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 to be sensitive to me. And I said to him, you know, Mr. Judge, you are wonderful, and I'm very glad to have met you, but my parents named me Uri, and I will stick to that name. And he said, good for you. Okay, now, on to Berkeley. Um, and the most important, I think, story before I go Hebrew Union College and then the Skirball. Um, I arrived in Berkeley. Thank goodness they had co-ops. Again, I went back to the kibbutz, except this was Berkeley. Okay? You, you would earn your money by washing your sheets, by serving dinner, by... I, I mean, I am the best wiper of utensils in this room. I, and without a washing, without a washing machine. I mean, I, if you want to wait later, you want to ask me how to do it, I'll tell you. Where we can take forks and knives and, and, and whoa, we'll drive them just like that for you. One afternoon in my freshman year, 
Uh, I was reading the California Daily. I was waiting for a 6 o'clock class, and it said, there is a meeting at the student union of a bunch of folks who want to create a camp for underprivileged children from the Oakland area. Um, I said, you know, I've got an hour. Why not? Now, I'm telling you, I went to that meeting because of my uncles. I went to that meeting because there was something in me that said underprivileged, people who want an experience, and by walking, I've never been to camp incidentally, but by walking out, and this is a warning you've all had it uh, in your lives, went to the bathroom, came back, and I was the director of, I was the director of Cal Camp. <laughs> we founded it, and the question was by the social worker who said, you know, Uri, we can't send 200 kids to camp into the mountains. They don't have pants warm enough. So I said, is that my job? She said, you make it your job. I said, well, what do I do? She says, there is a company. It's called Levi Strauss and Company. It's a 92nd, it's 92 Battery Street. Here's the phone number, you call them. I called. There's a lot of strength in that naivete, or stupidity, whichever you want to. Uh, and I called, and it was late in the afternoon, and uh, um, somebody answered, with whom would you like to speak? I said, I'd like to speak to the CEO of the company. And uh, because I'd read a previous, the summer before, I read a novel about a CEO and how powerful. And then, so you read it, you call. Okay, the secretary, Rita Guiney, just died last month at the age of 95, said to me, who are you? The answer was, in a sense, I said, my name is Uri Hersher, but it wasn't Uri Hersher. I am my grandmother's grandchild. I am my uncle's nephew. That's who I am. But obviously, that wouldn't have mattered. And she said, I said, I'm a freshman at Berkeley. What do you need? I need 200 pairs of pants, socks, shirts, and I just went through the whole thing. And you called the CEO's office? We have a community office. I said, don't, don't switch me. Don't switch me to another person. I just, I, I read about the CEO. Don't, please. Rita just cracked up. And she said, Walter Haas is not in a good mood. And I said, that's not my problem. <laughs> she put him through and she said, I may get fired. I said, you won't be fired. Puts it through, hello, who is this? And I said, my name is Uri Hersher. You'll never get to know me. I'll never get to know you. The only purpose of this call is to get 200 pairs of pants, shirts. At the time, they did belts. They did. He said, you're joking. He says, Mrs. Haas is in my office and we're about to go to a, uh, to a party. I said, well, I hope you enjoy the party. But please, before you go to the party, you need to say yes. He said, you know, you really are a stupid freshman. But I'm not easily humiliated. You're a stupid freshman. You need 800 pairs of pants because obviously they're not going to be the same size. And if you want to return some of them, you'll return some of them. I said, Mr. Haas, I now understand why you're the chairman of the board, and I am a stupid freshman. And, and that's it. He said, that, but I want to come and see you. I, I come and see me. You'll have to pick up the pants. To move forward very quickly, uh, he says, I have a son at Berkeley. His name is Bob Haas and see if you can call him, maybe he'll be interested in the camp. I said, is this a conditional gift? He said, no, no, you're getting your pants, I just want to know if... Uh, um. So, uh, I met Bob, 
That was 50 years ago. There has not been a week in 50 years where Bob and I have not had a two-hour conversation um, each week. From doing a good deed came $140 million that has been the support of the San Francisco Levi Strauss extended family to the Skirball Cultural Center. Welfare, welfare, doing good, giving you a perspective and a memory. The next chapter was Hebrew Union College. As I said at the table a few minutes ago, by going to the Hebrew Union College, the vertical of history took place. I began to understand that my uncles were not born without knowledge and that all of a sudden I understood that we are the inheritors of a tradition whose central core is the welfare of community. I got a sense of history, it made me stronger. It made me so much stronger. I understood that Abraham's first act is to welcome the stranger. How magnificent it is when God says to him, you don't have to rise for prayer because you're not feeling well, and he rises to welcome the stranger. So commentators say, that is, for the Jew, it is more important to rise to welcome the stranger than to rise for prayer. I have lived that philosophy. Whatever one thinks of God, I know for sure of one thing. He, she, whatever, needs good partners. Just like the bread that you have on your table needed good partners and partners that believe, as we all do, in the importance of social welfare. So I thank Hebrew Union College. I, th I cannot begin to thank Hebrew Union College, and I'm so thrilled for the relationship with USC, and I'm so thrilled that there's a skirball that, 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 that is the west side venue of what could become a great association. And, and uh, I'm pleased with the relationships I've, I've had with Max and Steve and predecessors. Uh, the reason I've had any strength in giving advice goes right back to a core belief that we are in search of a civil society. And so my book, appropriately, is entitled In Search of Utopias. And uh, I know all of the traps of utopia, but I think we still need to think of a utopia and just figure out a way in which to create it. And that's social welfare. Skirball Cultural Center. The Skirball Cultural Center was meant to be a culmination of what I learned at Hebrew Union College and frankly what I learned from my family. Jewish life did not begin with the Holocaust. It did not begin with the State of Israel. It began with core social welfare values that are 3,500 years old. So I've said this before, I'll say it again. I am 70 years old. I'm also 3,500 years old. And I do look great for being 3,500 years old. But I am 3,500 years old, so that when I come to confer with you and to share my thoughts of social welfare, I am easily 3,500 years old, with a rich tradition where the core is community and the memory of community. The Skirball Cultural Center today is a cultural village of civility. 
There are 200 of us who work there. We have 650,000 visitors, 200,000 children who had no clue what a clean bathroom looks like, who had no clue of immigration history, social history, no clue of world music beyond California. They come and they bring their parents and we give them what I hope is the biggest hug and welcome anywhere to be found. So I would say we were born a hugging people, an embracive people, but, and here is the but that relates to you, to USC, to other institutions. No one can do it alone. No one can do it alone. My hope is that as you record history and as you attempt to apply it, that we become collaborators. We cannot do it alone. USC and Skirball are tied in collaboration for a purpose, for a purpose. And as long as we keep on the mission, we at the Skirball take a 3,500 year history and we intersect it with American democratic ideals. I honor, and then we're open for 10 minutes of questions. I stand here and my grandmothers are really vivid in my mind. Their courage, their belief that human beings are hopeful. Um, my uncles, at the moment, I, I've left my grandmothers and I've been transported to Kfar Masaryk, and my uncle is saying to me, communism is the answer. The other uncle says, I think maybe it's socialism. The Hebrew Union College says, let's evaluate how best we can reach the goals that we have in tradition and apply them to our students. And here I am with you, the recorders of memory joined in with yet another record. And I am an optimist. I think as long as we bring to history a sense of perspective that we were not born yesterday, but aren't we lucky that others were and we were mentored by them. And here we are who we are today. Thank you. My uncles are wondering what applause they just heard. Any questions? I think the first major contribution is that we have created a Jewish entity, a Jewish umbrella that is not just for Jews. It's really crucial. Synagogues are for Jews. You know, it's a Catholic church is for Catholics. We are a cultural center that pursues the Jewish values and applies it to the community, which means there are no strangers among us in this community and everyone is welcome at the Skirball. And they're welcome to feel good we are a people of immigration. Skirball celebrates immigration. Skirball is offended, is offended by those who are not free. Um, uh, Skirball is offended if there's any abusive behavior that takes place. Um, it has attempted to create a civil community, which is an example to community. 
we are totally politically connected. We know who's on city council. We know who is on the county. They've all been there. They all say, this is a model that we might try to replicate. After all, the skirball is just a small corner of the world. The question is, can we expand upon it? Uh, we are building, after having built, although I call it a little village, we have 600,000 square feet under roof. The most, if you haven't been there, let me tell you, you haven't lived. <laughs> you you got to come. It's a beautiful aesthetic oasis with the diversity of this city working there. And so it is a contribution in that it's also, you look, we have perceptions of who Jews are. We have perceptions of who Koreans are. We have perception of who Chinese are, who, who are Mexicans. We have all these perceptions. We never talk. So I would say it's a place of gathering and it's safe. I think to create a safe place for people to gather is a huge contribution by itself. So I, I, I'm, I'm very happy about it. I, I'd like to think about it as my San Jose experience. I arrived in San Jose. I was the only Jew in school. Wow, what a wonderful embrace, what a wonderful hug. It made me, immigrants are insecure. They're vulnerable. Skirball makes sure that those who arrive do not remain vulnerable after the experience. So that's what I think we've been trying to do. Please. Uh-huh. Sure. I think it plays out that very directly. We had some commissioners who were quite harsh. So no matter whoever came before them, they were harsh. I'm not harsh. I remember a wonderful Talmudic saying, the shy student does not learn from a harsh teacher. So if you really wish to teach something, or learn something, first of all, there is an ear. Not everybody who came before the Ethics Commission had committed a huge crime. We're human. Try to remember that I'm human. I try to remember that Uri also walked. We all walked edges, and some of us fell in one direction, some in the others. I, th I think that what, what, what I learned in my upbringing was None of us have a monopoly on knowledge or judgment. I brought that to the City Ethics Commission. And um, aside from needing to get up early and get there on time downtown, I really did enjoy it. And the other thing I did, which was really important, I listened to the staff. They're the ones who were pre preparing the cases. And, and I listened really carefully to them. So, <laughs> most of city council has marched before me because of an ethics violation. It's usually somebody sent me two $100 bills from the same checkbook. Um, uh, none of us was, I, I've never really had to meet with somebody that I called a criminal. And uh, whatever the consequences were, I tried to make them fair to what had happened. Uh, so I think it's, yeah, totally connected I, uh, uh, of who I am. I, I think that there's probably some contemplation. I think there is an attempt to do something like this in Philadelphia. Uh, but there is no replication because of one aspect. None of them go into 3,500 years. I, you know, it's, a, it's very important for me to say to all of you in this room, the Cultural Center began, if, if you were to ask me, 
what would you call it? The first thing that you called it, I called it a Thank You America Cultural Center. I think one of the things that this cultural center does that we don't do too often as institutions is to thank America. I wouldn't be here. Guess none of you would be here. If at some point, some courageous relative, through harsh means, some people went through denigration, degradation, all of which I absolutely hate, somehow between 1880 and 1920, 30 million immigrants came to this country. It was the largest movement of human cargo in the history of this country. Among them were two and a half million Jews of the 30 million. These people basically came here as shareholders of this nation. For some, it took a long time to be shareholders. For many, it was immediate. The reason I have optimism for welfare and I have some optimism for the future, let that not be forgotten. We are shareholders. We all get one vote, but we share in the destiny of a country. And I'm being, on purpose, Pollyannish, I really believe in it. And if every immigrant came here and said, here is how I would like to add to the welfare of the state of California. And this is what I bring with me from my background that I think will add to the welfare of California. I'm counting on that. It's going to be a much better state. Without immigration, this country cannot renew itself. I'm totally dependent on the younger Uris and the younger folks who came here to add, to add to this experience by the experience that they brought with them. And um, so the key word, I think, is, um, is welcoming the stranger which is in the biblical text as the first act of a Father Abraham that is shared at least by three faiths. Okay, I thank you. I kept to my time. And, uh, and I'm looking for my watch to see how much longer you would have had to stay. Thank you for the award. to take a breath. Very, very inspiring, very powerful words of wisdom. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hersher. Thank you. Another round of applause for our speaker. With that, I would like to uh, introduce our next presenter of uh, one of our awardees, um, Dr. Uh, Jim Kelly, who is the president of 150,000 member NASW uh, in the United States and president of Menlo College. 
We're fortunate to have him here today to participate uh, in this event. Uh, he's also very active on our Hall of Distinction Committee, and his job today is to uh, introduce our next honoree uh, in, uh, for the uh, George Nickel Award. <clears throat> As two presidents, uh, it's important that you can tell stories because I really don't have much else to do. Uh, first, I want to uh, uh, say hello to all my friends that are here. It's really nice seeing you from uh, my different labor layers of jobs that I've had in L.A. County and the good friendships that I've had over the years. Um, it's hard to follow our last speaker. Um, I do come from a, um, a secular Jewish family. Um, <clears throat> my uh, my in-laws on my partner's side uh, were, were, were both gay, but I have um, the hardest thing for my mother-in-law was when uh, we came out to them was, well, at least you could have found a Jew. But the nice thing was that I graduated from Brandeis, and so I got myself a Jewish doctor while I was at Brandeis, and so for the last 36 years we've been doing quite well together. Uh, but. I spent four of my best summers here at SC. I was real fortunate uh, in the years between my master's degree and my doctorate that I spent time at the Anders Gerontology Center. Uh, at age 20, I was trying to be an expert on aging and social welfare, and I had uh, the most wonderful group of faculty from Al Feldman and Francis Feldman, and um, just wonderful uh, Nathan Schock, uh, Jim Barron, just, just wonderful, wonderful people. And um, I spent about two hours today just walking around campus and reminiscing. Um, and wouldn't you believe that I ran into two people that I knew, uh, and who were they? One was a student from my college who transferred to USC uh, and just walking the grounds. And then the other was one of our biggest donors to our college uh, uh, is, uh, there's a daughter here and uh, they're from Saudi Arabia. And she comes from one of the wealthiest families in Saudi Arabia and she just loves USC. So, um, you know, it's nice to be back. It's nice to see you all. Um, I am here for, uh, to say congratulations to all of the honorees, uh, uh, both for the um, National Association of Social Workers and for myself. Uh, they're wonderful people. But I'm here to talk a little bit about Sue Peck, uh, Sue Dvorak Peck. Uh, there's a whole page about her in the, uh, the program, and it's all true. She's done all those things. Uh, she came to USC, she got herself uh, an MSW, and she got involved in the community, and she's been doing it ever since. I call her a social worker's social worker, because uh, whenever you get into difficulty uh, or you need some help or advice, uh, the phone that you pick up and call is Sue. Uh, she's always level-headed. Um, she always looks for the big picture. Uh, and she always uh, knows uh, how to do the right thing. Um, we travel around a lot to uh, memorial services uh, uh, at this stage of our lives, and uh, people are always asking me, well, what type of social work does Sue do? And I have to tell them that, you know, that she works with the homeless in Malibu, that uh, part of her, uh, her life is that, you know, she's bought 43 different pieces of property in Malibu, and she's, she rents them to stars. And uh, so I'll be calling and talking to her on the telephone, and she'll be getting 100,000 pounds of rocks delivered to an oceanfront home. And, um, you know, uh, we laugh about that, and then we do our business. But she's one of the most grateful, wonderful people you will ever meet. She is uh, one of the most generous people you'll ever meet, uh, be that with her time and her money. Uh, I would like to read uh, a statement from Gary Bailey, the president of the International Federation of Social Workers. This is a group that represents 500,000 social workers around the world. I am delighted and honored to be able to extend greetings and thanks on behalf of the International Federation of Social Workers to you as you receive this very well-deserved honor. I only wish that I could be there with you in person. Please know that we, your global colleagues, applaud you for your hard work and dedication to our profession. And I am personally so very thankful for your continued support, your visionary and committed leadership to our profession, and ongoing support during stress-filled times. 
I look forward to continuing to have opportunities for us to work together. As I pondered whether or not to run for the presidency of the International Federation, you were one of the first people to whom I reached out to for council support, and you continue to be cheering me on in the Federation. You worked to establish the IFSW Friends Program, which continues to be a source of support and connection for those who are interested in international social work. You have been instrumental both at NASW at the national and state level, and we have worked to be an even stronger organization. You have played such an important role in advocating for more prominent representation of us as social workers in the media, and have worked tirelessly to enhance the image of our profession. To say that you have been a very important person to the International Federation of Social Work is an understatement. In your role as IFSW ambassador, and the only one in the world, you have been a source of wise counsel and advice for both presidents and secretary generals alike. You've been willing to step into the breach and offer assistance and support with great dignity and professionalism, and your contributions have been significant, meaningful, and very much appreciated. Please know that I join those present at this event along with your family in thanking you for all that you have done and will continue to do. Congratulations and best wishes for a well-deserved honor. Gary Bailey. Sue. It's an understatement, but thank you, Jim, for the warm welcome. I'm very humbled by this award given to me by CSWA to honor the work of George Nickel. My special thanks to Dean Flynn, the CSWA board headed by Esther Gillies, and staff by Katie Mikulski. I'd also like to congratulate my fellow awardees, past and present. I'd like to acknowledge the many people who've been there for me for a long time. My mentors like Chauncey Alexander, colleagues, friends, family, and my husband John. Most SC undergraduates don't gravitate towards social work. In my last semester, just before graduation in psychology, I went on a field trip to the USC County Hospital. There, I was inspired by an MSW who was making a real difference for individuals and their families. After that trip, I literally ran to the School of Social Work to meet with the Dean of Admissions, Dick Thor. Though I had no real social work experience, the school took a chance with me, and I was, and I am grateful. Years later, in the late 80s, I was traveling to Washington, D.C. for an NASW board meeting. Mike Wallace of 60 Minutes was seated next to me. Before takeoff, I used my cell phone, which in those days were the size of a brick. Mike Wallace asked me what I did for a living that I needed a cell phone, which were rare in those days, because they also weighed as much as a brick. I told him I was a professional social worker and that my colleagues and I were advocates for persons who are often at the margins of society and that we needed to use the same resources to help our clients that CBS required. At the time I was president of NASW, our missions were different. Mine was to empower, his was to inform, but our goals were the same making the world a better place. I believe then and I believe now that if we're to successfully empower others, we must be empowered ourselves. Our clients need us to be among the movers and shakers to influence the perception of the policymakers and those they represent, including the very influential media and entertainment industry. 
Mike Wallace was interested, and of course I was hoping for a long profile of our work on 60 Minutes. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. However, I'm very proud of the other communication successes that I've been part of working through NCN, the NASW Communications Network, a nonprofit I founded to partner with media and entertainment. <clears throat> the Trials of Rosie O'Neill was a primetime television show in the 90s on CBS. Social work was accurately portrayed on the show because social workers were the consultants that shaped the show. CBS 48 Hours, Somebody's Child, showed real social workers in action in children's services and the foster care system. PBS consulted with social workers. Social workers appeared on CNN Day Watch and NBC's The Today Show. But why is this important? 15 million plus viewers tune in for entertainment, but also learn about child welfare, mental health, and other social issues which can dramatically offer a more realistic perception of our clients and our profession. Our work in the 90s was a part of the foundation for today's NASW public education efforts, including the very popular website, Social Workers Speak. My conversation with Mike Wallace took place more than 20 years ago. Cell phones are now light as a feather, but the need for social workers grows heavier by the year. My passion, and I hope my contribution, has been to broaden our view of ourselves as active players in the power arenas, including media and entertainment, for our clients, our profession, and our society. I thank you for this recognition, and with this award, I would like to honor the many professional social workers who day in and day out work so hard to uphold the values of our profession, but who never have the opportunity to be publicly recognized. I thank USC School of Social Work for taking a chance on me, and I'll continue to fight on. Sue, thank you so much for those wonderful, wonderful comments. Last year, the CSWA inaugurated an award named after our beloved co-founder and friend, Francis Lomas Feldman. This award recognizes an individual who has demonstrated exceptional qualities in the area of education, whether as a scholar or as an educator. This distinguished recognition reflects Professor Feldman's passion for education, and for preserving and learning from history. Today, we are happy to have Francis's daughter, Donna Munker, with us to present the Excellence in Education Award to uh, our next honoree. Uh, please welcome Donna Munker. Thank you, Esther. Um, I have to admit that I don't consider myself qualified to tell you about June's many excellent achievements and qualities as an educator, um, only to speak of her as a, an old and dear friend of our family. Um, but I would like to take this opportunity to say something that I haven't yet in the last few years had a chance to tell her. Um, <laughs> pardon me starting with the fact, of, of course, as all of you know who knew my mother, Frances Lomas Feldman, social work education was the most meaningful activity of her rich and varied career, and so it's not really an accident that her friendship with June Brown, which began when she hired June for her first social work job, I believe, in 1940, 
was among the most meaningful and long-lasting relationships of her life, and it's not surprising that it deepened and deepened as they uh, were not only uh, uh, workers together and colleagues in uh, the agency, but also teachers and educators. So they worked together, they taught together, they traveled together, and they celebrated their birthdays together. And what I'd like to say is that even though I wasn't always around, I know that they had a lot of fun together because after my mother's death a few years ago, I found an old photo of my mother and June, and I think, as I recall, um, there were one or two other African-American women social workers. It seemed to be a newspaper photo, and from the hairstyles, I guessed that it was taken in the early 1940s. Everybody had linked arms, and they were just laughing their heads off, as if they didn't have a care in the world. And I looked at this photo, and I, it was almost as if a voice from that time were speaking to me and telling me what I should learn from it almost 70 years later. L.A. in those days, as you know, was a segregated town. And by that time, a few years ago, I was old enough to know what I had not known when I knew June as a child and as a uh, part of my extended family from the School of Social Work. And that newspaper photo said more than any words could say about the courage and the intrepidity and the perseverance of both June and my mother and about the significance of their life and close friendship in a larger way. So, June, what I wanted to say is that that friendship of yours helped educate Francis's daughter, too, about some of the important things of life. And so I feel especially pleased and honored to be the one to present you with the Francis Lomas Feldman Award for Excellence in Education today. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, I'd like to um, say thank you to the archives for a most unexpected honor. I have been gone from USC School of Social Work 19 years. I didn't imagine that anybody left remembered me. <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon and to see many familiar faces, many whom I have missed and who I think of fondly. Thank you, Donna, for the invitation, uh, for the introduction. It comes full circle and very surprisingly so that the daughter of the woman who opened the door to social work to me uh, was the person to uh, be a part of this recognition and this honor. Francis hired me before there was fair employment practices. 
and before there were the entitlements that um, apply at this point in the nation's history. And of course I was delighted, I needed a job uh, by this time, and I was delighted to be hired. But in retrospect, it wasn't that I was hired, it was more where I was hired. The county had 10 uh, district offices, nine of which were relief offices, but not Belvin. It was a social agency. Um, our clients did not have to go to the grocery store with vouchers. They came in weekly for cash so that they could go in as anyone else goes in as a customer. And when any of our youngsters graduated from junior high school or high school, there was an extra allowance for new clothes. So it really uh, is more that she introduced me to a profession that I didn't know more than uh, she hired me for my first job. She left uh, about three years later and I really didn't see her for years until I came into the master's program and she was here. And it was from that point, Donna, that we really became uh, friends. Because believe me, the new hire was not having coffee with the district director. <laughs> um, and it, uh, the, the final pleasure to have Donna do this was her mother uh, preparing her to be an adequate young woman knowing that um, part of life uh, had to do with career. Donna was brought to the agency periodically. So I have really known her since she was a little girl. And what, what a pleasure to um, come full circle today. The next thank you I would like to give to um, friends from various arenas of my life who heard of this and I wasn't the one who advertised it who heard of this and um, are here to celebrate with me today um, first of all there's my old colleague Bruce Bruce came and he was just a kid. <laughs> and is Ramon here? Yeah. Ru Bruce and Ramon uh, came, I suspect, two or three years after I started. And um, he always seemed like my kid brother. <laughs> but I heard some of the students the other, not so long ago that we were at a meeting, refer to him as the Uncle Bruce. <laughs> so, um, so it's a pleasure to have a colleague. It's a pleasure um, to have people who were students who seem to have remembered the time well. And there's Sandra Lang, who was in my very first class. And I am sure, I was not sure that I was going to walk in that class <laughs> or not. But we say it's almost 40 years later, and we still know how to find each other. So it is a pleasure. Um, there are other people at the table. Francis Cable was, I think, my only doctoral student. And uh, Nancy uh, Jefferson was a student, but she has become, she was my neighbor, and now she looks after me in my old age. <laughs> Um, I <clears throat> would really like to end by, by saying that there is a, an important role, and I think I feel now more than ever before, an important role for 
an entity like the social welfare archives. The 20th century, I think we can look at as a remarkable century in terms of the progress that was made in the 20th century toward the objectives that were articulated in the late 18th century by the founding fathers. The indication, the implication that every individual had a right to a free and a fulfilled life at a time when people were enslaved, at a time that people were accepted as the means to the ends of other people. They articulated the, the, um, the goal, but it really took the 20th century, I think, um, with um, the thrust of progressive reform in which social workers were leaders to bring us to what um, <clears throat> was, was said that it is important for the, so, for the society to establish circumstances in which people can grow, develop, and become, to live their lives well and autonomously. Much progress was made during the 20th century. Do I have to remind you that it was called the century of the child? The U.S. Uh, Children's Bureau led tremendous reform, all the way from maternal and child health to a range of reforms on, the, uh, on behalf of children. And I say sometimes that we who were children uh, and beneficiaries of progressive reform probably were the best cared for children of ordinary people who have ever lived. But if we look at some of the systems, they no longer function as they did. We owe to the next, to the coming generations more than we're giving them. And as I see some disarray in the body politic, it seems to me that something like the archives has a very important role to play to help current Americans know what early Americans have done and did on behalf of the welfare of children, the welfare of workers, the welfare of people. So I am hoping that the archives will maintain uh, its commitment to putting together what has been done in this nation on behalf of children, with particular uh, notice that California was among the leaders of reform on behalf of children, the quality of public schools in the state, the removal of children from the criminal court and the development of probation services, and the California Youth Authority, which was a model for the nation. We have any number of things as a state to, be to have been proud of, but as we see daily news accounts, they're not doing well. So one would hope that the archives ability to pull together that treasure of records of when California as a state was building. Perhaps someone will, or some group of people, will um, look seriously as to what has been done, what was done with success, and what can be replicated. So I'll end by saying Thank you again to um, the dean, the school, for a wonderful career, and to remember the, that first 
cadre of faculty of this school who were superb mentors to those of us who came along. Thank you. Thank you so much, June. I was one of those students that uh, sat through class after class with June many years ago. Um, if I may have your attention for just a few more minutes, we're almost finished, but I have a need to acknowledge some special people before we end today's event. Um, first, we want to remember those friends of the archives who've left us this year. Ruth Britton, the last of the founding members of the archives, uh, is, uh, has departed uh, as of a few months ago. John Cooley, a past president of our organization, and within the last few weeks, uh, we experienced the loss of Josephine Yelder. Julian Reyes, who is an MSW intern working with us this year to get a better idea of private nonprofits and how they operate, what it takes to make it work. And uh, a special thank to the School of Social Work, the External Affairs Department, and all of those who continue to support us in our work. Um, in the meantime, uh, after I, I know that you're all going to race right out and go to our website and find out more about us, uh, we will look forward to seeing all of you at future events. Thank you very much for your participation today. <laughs>